Good afternoon. I'm Tamia Folks. And I'm Sophia Madoy. Today on The Badger Report, we will bring you updates on this week's events, the election, and COVID-19. High voter turnout in the presidential election is likely due to the number record of first-time voters. Find out how this group made a difference coming up on The Badger Report. And later in our newscast, we'll try to check in with a local food pantry to see what they're doing to help people in need during the pandemic. We'll also learn about a local holiday lights drive through display you can see without leaving your car. From Vilas Hall on the campus of the University of Wisconsin Madison, this is the Badger Report. Welcome to this week's Badger Report. In coronavirus news, Governor Tony Evers has plans to extend the statewide mask mandate into the next year. The indoor mask requirement extension comes as Wisconsin continues to see alarming increasing in not only positive COVID tests, but also in deaths caused by the virus. The latest COVID-19 numbers from the State Department of Health Services show a daily increase of more than 6,600 new cases. Wisconsin now has a seven-day positive test rate of just more than 33%. Another 83 deaths were also reported. Wisconsin is now ranked as the sixth highest state in the country for new COVID cases, according to the Centers of Disease Control. Governor Tony Evers also signed an executive order urging people to stay home again before addressing the state of Wisconsin about the dangers present as the virus continues to rise. We must get back to the basics of fighting this virus just like we did last spring. And it starts at home. Evers is stressing limiting social distancing and interaction, especially during the upcoming holiday season. He recommends holding holiday celebrations virtually with anyone outside of your immediate home. On Tuesday, Governor Evers released a $541 million package of proposed legislation. Among the bills he introduced were measures that would ban evictions and allow residents who have lost their jobs to claim unemployment benefits immediately. Evers' bills would also require insurance companies to pay for COVID-19 testing, treatment, medicine, and vaccines. In response to Evers' plans, Assembly Speaker Robin Voss held a press conference but did not offer any specific legislation. Instead, Voss said he wanted to double the number of contract tracking workers, providing lawsuit protections for business, and expand rapid testing throughout the state. With the COVID infection rate on the rise, students at the University of Wisconsin-Madison are facing the consequences of the virus firsthand in a way that many of them never could have anticipated. I spoke to some UW-Madison nursing students to see what their experience is like as frontline healthcare workers. Last week Tuesday, Governor Tony Evers issued an executive order urging people throughout the state of Wisconsin to stay home as cases of COVID-19 continue to rise and hospitals reach increasingly high capacity. Student healthcare workers are dealing with the first-hand consequences of the pandemic in hospitals. Like my job was very normal at the beginning, like I was used to having to take care of people, but I wasn't used to having to see like death so fast. Anything that's just like, it comes with like a personal story that I feel like people need to hear. Evers' executive order, though it did not impose any new restrictions on Wisconsin residents, specifically highlighted the struggles of healthcare workers in the state. You can probably tell that I have bruises from my N95 mask that I have to wear for 10 hours a day. So it's a whole different ball game. And like, I don't know, being short staffed, on a normal day is terrible, but being short staffed when like everyone is in need of somebody is even worse. (laughs) Over the weekend, cases of COVID-19 reached a high of 8,418 cases in one day. The city of Madison, which has been a hub for COVID cases and students returned to campus in the fall, remains a primary concern for students and community members alike. 
Across our state, families, workers, and communities continue to face the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. Our healthcare workers are going to work every day, working three, sometimes four shifts in a row, often, often having to reuse or share masks and putting themselves and their families at risk to do their jobs. On Tuesday, Dane County officials placed a ban on indoor gatherings and limited outdoor gatherings to 10 people, while actions to quell the spread of the virus continue statewide. Wow, did the students you spoke to say that they found it challenging to be competing with their schoolwork while dealing with the stress? Yeah, absolutely. A lot of them shared that this experience had really increased their stress and also had a deep impact on their emotional turmoil that they had been experiencing in school. But they hope that from this experience, they can help to better educate their peers. And we're continuing to hear promising news about the COVID vaccine. Drug maker Pfizer announced that its vaccine is shown to be 95% effective in recently concluded clinical trials. And the company will be seeking emergency authorization from the Food and Drug Administration and begin administering the vaccine. Another pharmaceutical company, Moderna, also announced that the vaccine was found to be 94.5% effective in recent trials. And Moderna will also be seeking FDA authorization soon. Without a vaccine, the pandemic continues to hit the restaurant industry hard, and entrepreneurs have to think outside of the box to survive. R.I. Shirley with the Badger Report has the story. COVID-19 is forcing even the established local restaurants to close. However, the year-old Caspian Grill hasn't shut their doors yet. The owner is putting all efforts and savings in to keep it afloat. We don't have any in indoor water customers, but we still have any water delivery and carry out orders. Regina Sheila says buying a delivery van with his personal funds has been the best solution for his business. As a result, new customers have brought a nearly 30% increase in sales. To see more customers supporting creative entrepreneurs, the Wisconsin Restaurant Association urges people to dine in restaurants. The one thing that we do know is restaurants are a particularly safe place to go. They do a lot of sanitization, they are doing social distancing, they're wearing masks, they're having their staff wear masks, and they're encouraging their customers to wear masks and so on. While fear of being exposed to the virus is widespread, few loyal customers continue to dine in and help restaurants survive the pandemic. It was really important to, to show our support because we enjoy the food so much. This is kind of our favorite place to go. We try to come at least once a week. Devoted customers continue to support their favorite restaurants. This is especially important during winter when customer attendance is already low. For The Badger Report, I'm Arai Sherala. Thanks, Arai. We'll be watching to see if restaurants can survive the pandemic and the winter months. Turning to election news, the state of Wisconsin has now finished canvassing all ballots from their November 3rd election. In all, former Vice President and now President-elect Joe Biden received 20,565 more votes than President Donald Trump here in Wisconsin. In all, more than 3.2 million Wisconsinites voted in the election. In the Electoral College, Joe Biden now has 290 votes to Trump's 232 votes. Donald Trump has still not conceded the election. Of those who turned out to cast a ballot earlier this month, a record number of them were young voters. The Badger Report's Lily Zoller has the story. The Center for Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement estimates that 50 to 52 percent of eligible voters under the age of 29 cast a ballot in the 2020 presidential election. That's nearly 10 points higher than in 2016. As a young person, I wanted to make my voice heard because we're going to be living with the consequences of any legislature's actions for the rest of our lives. While youth are known to be politically active as young adults, their participation via voting is unprecedented. It's a combination of when you're a young adult, late adolescent young adult, and starting to think about your world and your life and where you're going um, and what's happening. And so there's the, the coalescence of the historical moment, I think just really meant that a whole lot of young adults were paying attention and caring um, 
and wanting to stand for, you know, the, 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 the principles they believed in. Issues that drove young people to the polls varied, but many considered the planet and their status as young people when deciding who to vote for. Social justice and those issues, the environment, uh, women's rights, there's a million issues that I think uh, were really important to me in this election. But young people did more than just vote in the election. They aimed to make their voice heard in other ways, too. I worked at the polls. I posted on my social media a lot. I also helped make sure all my friends were registered. Experts are hopeful that the surge in political activism from young people is here to stay. For the Badger Report, I'm Lily Zoller. This is a trend that has occurred nationally. We'll keep our eyes on it. Although Vice President Joe Biden flipped the battleground state of Wisconsin this year, Republican leaders are searching for ways to undermine his victory. The Badger Report's Sally Young has the story. Sally, what can you tell us about this? Thanks, Tabia. Yeah, on Wednesday, the Trump campaign paid the Wisconsin Elections Commission $3 million to conduct a partial recount in Wisconsin. The recount will take place in the heavily Democratic Dane and Milwaukee counties, where the Trump campaign claims there was a substantial number of illegally cast absentee ballots. What a recount will do is that it will probably result in very slight changes in the vote totals. While the recount is expected to be completed by the December 1st deadline, Wisconsin Republican lawmakers are turning to other methods to impact the Democratic process. For the first time in 50 years, the Assembly Committee on Campaigns and Elections was granted subpoena powers by Assembly Speaker Robin Voss to investigate the integrity of the presidential election. In a statement, Voss cited concerns regarding mail-in ballot dumps and voter fraud, but did not provide any evidence for these claims. The, the notion that this shows any kind of irregularity is simply outright false, and it is uh, it is designed, in my view, to throw doubt uh, into legitimacy of the count, which is deeply corrosive and irresponsible. In the coming weeks, the committee will likely begin holding hearings and has already reached out to the Wisconsin Elections Commission to testify. We're confident that Wisconsin's elections processes are sound and we're happy to provide any information that they're seeking. Wow, a $3 million payment is a hefty fee from the Trump campaign for the recount in just two counties. Why? It is a significant charge, Sophia. In 2016, the Jill Stein campaign paid a little over $3 million to conduct a recount for the entire state of Wisconsin. According to the Wisconsin Elections Commission, the steep cost this year is due to the complications of recounting ballots during the COVID-19 pandemic. Thanks, Sally. The results of the 2020 election have left Wisconsinites more divided than ever. President-elect Joe Biden ran on a platform that promised to bring Americans together after four years. But can that actually happen? The Badger Report's Nathan Denzine has more. The people united will never be divided. The 2020 election has left Wisconsin more politically divided than ever before. Wisconsin's presidential race was again decided by a razor-thin margin, just like it was in 2016, and the gulf between the right and the left seems larger than ever before. I uh, uh, certainly have never seen the nation as divided as it is in my entire lifetime. Dr. Davidson studies emotions for UW-Madison and says the first step towards bridging the divide is to practice genuine listening. Uh, we need to do a better job of taking the perspective of another and appreciating um, why a person may feel the way she or he does. Davidson said that it is difficult to practice skills like listening and empathy without using them for a while, but that instead it would take time and practice to develop those skills. Voters in Madison said that they hoped a Joe Biden presidency would ease the tensions between the right and the left. Towards the beginning here, It'll stay pretty divided, but I feel like as the next four years go on, everything will kind of start to come together. I don't think in his entire length as president, whether that ends up being four or eight years, he'll fix everything. But I do believe that a, a Biden presidency is a step in the right direction. 
While it's easy to talk about bipartisan compromise, ultimately only time will tell if our nation can heal as Inauguration Day gets closer. For the Badger Report, I'm Nathan Dunzine. Thanks, Nathan. The Center for Health and Minds at UW-Madison recently launched an app named the Healthy Minds Program that helps user practice those skills. Next on the Badger Report, we find out how a Madison fundraising campaign is helping charities survive the pandemic. And coming up after the break, we check in with a local food pantry to find out how they're managing an increased demand during the pandemic. You can try, but you'll never stop a badger. Because we badgers are born with curious minds and endless heart. When we see a curve in the road, we speed up. When there are mask shortages for first responders, we make our own supply chain. When there's a world on pause, we sharpen our claws. Through thunder, fire, and pandemics, we'll keep going. Because after all, you can't stop a badger. Partners in giving have raised over $80 million for charities across the nation since 1973. This year, Partners in Giving is teaming up with UW Health to raise money virtually during their Stronger Together campaign to help charities during the pandemic. When you drill down to what the charities are seeing, they're seeing the same thing everybody else is seeing. They're seeing their clients calling for emergency services. Can I get help with my rent? Can I get help with food? Um, the demand on food has been soaring ever since the pandemic initiated. So some of the charities that deal with those those 24-7 um, helplines have really seen a huge increase in the demand. Eggert says giving is always important, but more so now than ever before. The campaign started on October 12th and has already raised over a million dollars. It will run until November 27th, but Eggert says you can donate all year round. Thanksgiving is right around the corner. Check out this food pantry that I went to that's helping families prepare for this holiday. Welcome to the River Food Pantry. According to the program manager, Helen Abord Sinitus, counting both groceries and holiday boxes, this week the River Food Pantry is giving out 175 pounds of groceries. We're handing out ham, turkeys, or chickens. We're also giving everybody a cooking pan, a pie crust, and a box. of ingredients for Thanksgiving. The River Food Pantry is doing their best to serve the community in the midst of a pandemic. It's really picked up as far as the volume of people coming through. And there's just a lot of people that are having a hard time right now and are very appreciative of getting some extra support. Volunteers are getting boxes ready so that customers do not have to go into the warehouse. Next week, the food pantry will be providing a to-go holiday meal. Because we can't let anyone in unless they're a volunteer. Um, we don't want to pass the spread. You know? We don't want to be a super spreader. We want to just give out food. <laughs> wow, look at all those meals on wheels. Right? Nonprofits like this one really make a difference. As they've done in past, the Memorial Union is offering traditional pre-cooked meals. Thanksgiving dinners for students are available for pickup. Each individual meal is $10, but those students facing food insecurity may receive a free dinner. More information is available at union.wisc.edu. The Red Gym just got a facelift. Find out what that means for three student programs on campus coming up next. We'll also find out just how cold it's going to get this week after the break. You can try, but you'll never stop a badger. Because we badgers are born with curious minds and endless heart. When we see a curve in the road, we speed up. When there are mask shortages for first responders, we make our own supply chain. When there's a world on pause, we sharpen our claws. Through thunder, fire, and pandemics, we'll keep going. Because after all, you can't stop a badger. The Asian American Islander Desi American Student Center, also known as APIDA, the Latin Cultural Center, and the Gender and Sexuality Campus Center have officially finished renovating their spaces in the Red Gem and will soon be open for students to use. 
The APITA program coordinator, Tev Lee, hopes that this new space forms community. The space in and of itself is a representation of what APITA students are wanting to see here on campus, which is for their lived experiences and identities to be, um, to be visible. Lee also hopes the space showcases the program's past. Our space is a tribute to the legacy of the students who um, were active activists in that moment of knowing that this was a need for students and creating the space. Um, and now that the space has come to fruition, that this isn't the end. Lee believes that APITA still has a lot of work to do with visibility, but he hopes that the annual APITA Heritage Month during April will start that movement. The UW-Madison College of Agriculture and Life Sciences celebrated the opening of the new building on campus earlier this month. The new Meat Sciences and Animal Biology Discovery Building cost $57 million and offers more than 67,000 square feet of teaching and research space. While that's great news for the dairy and animal science students, there's a reason others on and near campus should take note as well. Inside the building is a brand new retail butcher shop called Bucky's Varsity Meats. The UW student and Bucky's Varsity Meats employee, Jenna Brogie, says that all the meat is processed on site and there's plenty of options to choose from, including beef, pork, chicken, and more. Because of the pandemic, the store itself isn't open to walk-in customers, but they do online orders for curbside and pickup. The new Meat Sciences building and Bucky's Varsity Meat Store is located at 11932 Linden Drive on the west end of the UW campus. It looks like near or below freezing temps are here to stay for a while. Let's find out exactly how cold it will get from J.D. Danielson, who has got our fo forecast looks in like weather. Thursday will mark the turning point for winter weather as this weekend will see returns to below freezing. This afternoon will be mostly cloudy with a high of 53 and a low of 40. This evening sees a high chance of rain, 60% likelihood of some showers. Saturday will be a lot of the same. A rainy high of 48 with evening lows around 36 and frigid winds blowing about seven to eight miles per hour from the northeast. The 60% chance of rain continues throughout the day and evening. On Sunday, the cold and wet just get cold and wetter. Highs of 46 with a 50% of chance of rain in the, in the morning with a low of 30 and a 30% chance of rain during the evening. The winds are expected to continue and increase, blowing about 10 to 15 miles per hour from the northeast. Monday, we'll see the cessation of rain, but also the projected low point for next week's temperatures, a high of 42 and a low of 29. Tuesday, we'll see a bit of a bump, partly cloudy, high of 45 and low of 34, a trend that should continue through the remainder of next week. No snow for now, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't bumble up, bundle up as we head towards December. That's it for your weather. I'm J.D. Danielson for the Badger Report. Back to you guys. Thanks, J.D. Looks like it's going to be a bit chilly for the next few days. I'm definitely going to break out my winter jacket this weekend and maybe even an umbrella. Up next in sports, we'll get updates on Badger football, hockey, and basketball. You'll also hear which local high school athletes have made their college decisions after the break. You can try, but you'll never stop a Badger. Because we Badgers are born with curious minds and endless heart. When we see a curve in the road, we speed up. When there are mask shortages for first responders, we make our own supply chain. When there's a world on pause, we sharpen our claws. Through thunder, fire, and pandemics, we'll keep going. Because after all, you can't stop a badger. With winter sports beginning, football wasn't the only University of Wisconsin athletic team in action this week. The Badger Report's Will Whitmore is here with sports. Thanks, Tamia. After a two-week hiatus, the Wisconsin football team dominated the Michigan Wolverines last Saturday in Ann Arbor. The Badgers controlled from the get-go, steamrolling the Wolverines in a 49-11 victory. The Badgers now move to 10th in the country after their statement win. Looking ahead, the Badgers have a massive game that could ultimately decide the fate of the Big Ten West. Wisconsin travels to Evanston Saturday to take on unbeaten Northwestern. 
After a disappointing 14-20-2 season, the Wisconsin men's hockey team started their 2020-21 campaign on the right note with the sweep of the Notre Dame Fighting Irish on Friday and Saturday. The 13th ranked Badgers will try to ride their momentum into a home series starting tonight against number six, Michigan. Expectations are high for Wisconsin basketball after winning a share of the 2019-20 Big Ten Championship last season. This past Saturday, the Badgers hosted their annual inner squad red-white scrimmage. Fans for the first time were able to take a look at this talented Badger team. For Wisconsin basketball, last Saturday marked the Badgers' first in-game action in their quest to repeat as Big Ten regular season champions. The Badgers enter the season ranked seventh nationally as Great Guard's team brings a lot of talent and toughness to the 2020-21 season. The Badgers are loaded with experience and return a class of six seniors. Guards Brad Davis and Demetrik Trice and Trevor Anderson round out the experienced backcourt with Nathan Reavers, Micah Potter, and Aleem Ford contributing up front. Players warmed up with the USA shooting drill to loosen up and get some shots up, then transitioned to five-on-five five action. While both teams started sloppy with a lot of turnovers, freshman newcomer Johnny Davis displayed his potential as the scrimmage went on. The 2020 Mr. Basketball in the state of Wisconsin showed his ability to stretch the floor and knock down the three-point shot. While Davis has impressed early, Wisconsin assistant coach Orlando Tucker wants him to still focus in on his fundamentals. Right, so a lot of these guys in high school, you can just surely make it off your, uh, or purely make it off your athletic abilities, right? When you get here, everything, all the emphasis on your footwork and the priorities to being able to do the right things and rip and be strong applies. So if they're not talking, they're not really understanding where to be, it shows really well, it shows very quickly. Davis's athleticism and shooting ability will provide a major spark off the bench this season. Wisconsin returns to action next Wednesday in an exhibition against Eastern Illinois. On top of fielding a great team for the 2020-21 season, the future is bright for the Wisconsin men's basketball team. The Badgers landed three four-star recruits, according to ESPN, as high school seniors Chucky Hepburn, Chris Hodges, and Matthew Morse all signed their national letter of intent to play at Wisconsin. Wisconsin's 2021 class is ranked 40th in the country according to 24-7 sports. Signing day is such a special day for high school prospects. We were able to speak to a couple of local signees about their decision to attend Wisconsin. In a year where sports have been impacted so heavily by the COVID-19 pandemic, the future looks bright for prep athletes Maddie Wilkie and Alexandra Cruz who signed their national letter of intent to attend the University of Wisconsin-Madison. For Wilkie, the decision was pretty easy as she was recruited by the Badgers since middle school. They started recruiting me when I was in eighth grade, so I got the chance to develop a really good relationship with the coaches and a lot of the players. And I got to see when some like the freshmen, how they became seniors and kind of I got to see them develop and I thought that was pretty cool. But Wilkie isn't the only signee who developed a close relationship with the UW program. Edgewood center back Allie Cruz will join her sister Madeline next year on Wisconsin's defense. Though the siblings are competitive with one another, Cruz is looking forward to playing with her sister again. I just think it's great because we've gotten really close over the years and I definitely think that she knows my potential and she'll definitely tell me if I'm not playing like I should be. As for what to expect from the new Badgers, both signees are excited about the opportunity and ready to contribute right away. I'm good, but I also just, you know, I want to prove it and just being able to play with the Wisconsin jersey and hopefully change the program like that's just that's so exciting to me and I'm so excited. The main thing I will bring is I think I like to consider myself a really big leader and coming in as a freshman. Um, I may not have that same impact, but I think that I'm very vocal player and just a very physical and I will make sure that I like the team is organized. So I think I bring an organization skill. The future is bright for Wisconsin athletics. Best of luck to both Allie and Maddie in their careers at Wisconsin. So the Badgers have a big game coming up this weekend. Can you tell us a little bit more about that, Will? Yes, it's going to be a defensive showdown between them and the Northwestern Wildcats. Both teams are ranked in the top 10 in defense, so expect a, so expect a slugfest in Evanston. Cool. Thanks, Will. Thank you. It's never too soon to get into the holiday spirit. 
see how this one local business is keeping the festivities alive while staying socially distanced. Coming up next on The Badger Report. You can try, but you'll never stop a badger. Because we badgers are born with curious minds and endless heart. When we see a curve in the road, we speed up. When there are mask shortages for first responders, we make our own supply chain. When there's a world on pause, we sharpen our claws. Through thunder, fire, and pandemics, we'll keep going. Because after all, you can't stop a badger. Christmas season is just around the corner, and many people are wondering what celebrating the holiday will look like this year. For 32 years, the electric company has hosted Holiday Fantasy and Lights in Madison's Olin Park. This fun, family-friendly event is the perfect opportunity to get into the holiday spirit while staying socially distanced. Through the month of December, community members will be able to visit Olin Park in their cars to catch a glimpse at the festival lights, featuring some of our favorite Madison staples like the State Capitol or even Bucky Badger. When people arrive to the event, they'll be able to tune into some fun Christmas tunes on the local radio station and also might even hear a special message from Santa. Hi guys, it's me, Annie. I'm still at it, talking to you on the radio at the Holiday Fantasy and Lights. This year, 2020, it's just me, and while my mom drove me here, of course, she promised to be quiet, but we'll see about that. This year marks 32 years for the Electric Group's Holiday Fantasy and Lights. 32 years of making memories in Madison's Olin Park. Memories and lights. And love. Shh, mom. And candy canes. <laughs> Our favorite. I might have to head on over and see those lights for myself. Go right ahead. I definitely recommend it. It was a super, super fun experience and it was definitely fun to see for the weekend. And just a reminder for all of our viewers, students will be leaving campus next week for Thanksgiving break and university officials have asked students who do travel home for the holidays to remain in their hometowns until the start of the spring semester. That's it for this week's broadcast. Thanks for tuning in. For the Badger Report, I'm Sophia Mador. And I'm Tamia Folks. Happy Thanksgiving and have a great weekend.